All right, it's good to be with you all from Houston. Thanks for tuning in. And thank you, Caesar and Roger, for your great talks. Hope everybody can see my full screen okay. And I'm gonna share my one year of experience of incorporating Micropulse into my retina practice in Houston. So the situation was I'd been in a practice in a multi-specialty group for a few years after finishing fellowship. And I decided to start my own solar retina practice um, with the opening date of June 1st, 2020. I had uh, no direct prior Micropulse experience, but I had uh, friends and colleagues at other retina practices in town who had the Micropulse and had been using it with good results. And I was eager to learn more about it and try it. So when I was setting up shop, there were a few key pieces of equipment that I needed. You know, obviously I needed my OCT. The fundus camera, I thought of it as more of a luxury and certain OCT units have a combined fundus camera option. I needed a laser, I needed a B scan and I needed my exam chairs and slit lamps. So um, after three years in the previous practice at the multi-specialty ophthalmology group, there was uh, no micropulse at that practice. It was an injection heavy practice. Uh, there was a lot of AMD, a lot of diabetic macular edema, retinal vein occlusion uh, in Houston where high blood pressure and diabetes are pretty rampant here. Um, and we had a continuous wave laser without micropulse, just a traditional thermal laser 532 argon and you know we had it available all the time for retinal tears uh, focal laser for eccentric microaneurysms diabetic macular edema and then of course prp for proliferative retinopathy but when i was deciding what kind of laser i wanted to incorporate to my practice it was really csr that tipped the scales for me i wanted something that i could use to treat these patients for CSR, because for the previous three years, when a CSR patient was sitting in front of me in the exam chair, I, there were a few less than ideal options that I could give to them. You know, number one, just monitor, do nothing, inform them that it's most likely uh, has the potential to resolve on its own after three to six months. Um, but it's not really satisfying to, you know, be somebody's physician and say, I'm not really going to do anything for you. I'm going to sit on it, even if they're bothered by a central scotoma and their work is impaired. Um, another option is a plerinone or Inspira. It's a pill that you can give 25 milligrams, take it daily with a long list of side effects, dizziness, diarrhea, cough, flu-like symptoms, fatigue. Um, good luck telling a 40 year old type A male that they could potentially develop gynecomastia from Inspira. And so that was a less than ideal option as well. And then the third option was just refer out. You know, these are the two options and we don't have micropulse laser at our practice. So I'll send you to my buddy at the neighboring retina practice and he can take care of you there. So um, I wanted something in my practice that I could offer for the CSR patients. Um, so, you know, one option would be PDT, buy a PDT laser, but this is how I felt when I was thinking about PDT is where do you find a PDT laser? Where do you find somebody who's experienced in injecting vertiporfin? Um, and then you have the issue of patients have to avoid the sun for five days, which is pretty difficult here in Texas. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, where are you going to find somebody who's actually a PDT candidate, somebody who's, you know, recalcitrant to anti-VEGF injections or somebody who fails micropulse laser. So finding the machine, number one, and number two, finding the PDT candidates would be difficult. So I decided I needed a micropulse laser in my practice. And there were two setup options. You know, number one, this is the old practice where you had the laser. It wasn't micropulse, but it was a laser unit that attached to a free slit lamp adapter to attach to any slit lamp in the practice. You know, so the thing is the, the laser can travel with you wherever you go. You could set it up that day. You could take it to a satellite office. Um, it's mobile. And the other option is to buy a fixed unit here on the right with, a, with its own table. And it's mounted on the table and mounted to a slit lamp that the Iridex provides. And so I opted for this option on the right because I had a specific room that I had in mind for the laser. And it worked out great for me because I was able to offer something immediately to my CSR patients. This was a case here that I would never forget. This patient came in to me uh, on January 12th of 2021 with huge subretinal fluid. 
Um, this was, man, the reason why I won't forget this, not just because it's a unique case, but because it was the day after I got the second dose of my Pfizer vaccine and I was having the headaches and the chills and all those symptoms. And he was sitting there and he wanted something for a CSR, a typical type A guy, uh, 2200 vision, difficulty working. And, you know, even in my, you know, sweating, you know, feverish condition, I was able to deliver a successful treatment for him that same day. I didn't have to wait a few months. I didn't have to refer him somewhere else. I could just offer him a treatment right there, a safe and effective treatment. So treatment date was July 12th, 2021. And here he is just five weeks later on February 19th, 2021. And the fluid is all resolved and the vision rec uh, recovered to 2020. And so that's been my experience with MicroPulse for fortunately every CSR patient that I've had in my practice over the past year. And they get to stay with me in the practice. I haven't sent them elsewhere. And another thing that really drew me to the MicroPulse was the versatility of the laser unit in general. It's a single unit that comes with the slit lamp that I could use both for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes in one room. So we're, this is my laser room here in the office. And I'm not sticking the laser somewhere in some other room that's gonna remain unoccupied for the entire day if I'm not doing a laser, okay? This is an excellent slit lamp comparable to a hog straight. And so I can use it as a diagnostic slit lamp. It has the blue light, it has all the filters. And then I could uh, change it over to the therapeutic option when I wanna actually deliver laser treatments. Traditional continuous wave thermal laser, slit lamp delivery for the microaneurysms and the eccentric DME posterior retinal tears, PRP, and then I can switch over to the indirect headset here for the peripheral retinal tears with scleral depression and uh, PRP for PDR and wheelchair bound patients. And then finally, it has the micropulse option to be able to switch over to micropulse treatments for CSR. And then what I wanted to see next was, could I incorporate this into my DME patients, my RVO patients and my neovascular AMD patients to try to reduce the injection burden as Caesar and Roger have been discussing. So there was data out there suggesting that micropulse is useful for reducing injection burden for both DME and neovascular AMD, and I was eager to try it. So here's a case of a 48-year-old phacic male with type 2 diabetes, and he had a history from another provider getting monthly ILEA injections. I believe he'd had about six injections, and the last one was about three months before he was referred to me. So you can see here on the fundus photos, you know, there are uh, microaneurysms and surrounding exudates in both eyes. But the visual acuity was 20-20 in the right eye. OCT looks pretty pristine with a tiny cyst there. And on the left eye, the vision was 20-30 with a larger cyst parafoveal and really kind of extending into the foveal area. So he was symptomatic in that left eye. And so I gave a uh, ILEA injection a couple of weeks later after getting the authorization on the 29th of July. So this was just two months into my practice, one of my first patients. And so here he is on September 4th, a few weeks later after the ILEA, the right eye is still stable and the left eye, there is improvement in the intraretinal cysts and the visual acuity improved to 2020. So here at this stage, he's 2020 now, he can read the smallest line on the eye chart but there is persistent fluid on the OCT. So what do we do? In a 2020 eye, should we repeat the ILEA injection? Should we try another injection? Or does the risk of injection outweigh the benefit? So in my opinion, and uh, Roger and Caesar, I'll be curious your opinion on this as well during the panel stage, but for a 2020 eye, I'm pretty hard pressed to put a needle in the eye. You know, I think the risk outweighs the benefit. You know, there's a less than one in 5,000 chance of an ophthalmitis, but it is an invasive procedure and you don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to go home and do yard work? Are they going to get sweat in the eye and maybe develop an infection? Uh, but at the same time, I don't like the fact that there's still intraretinal fluid on this OCT. So this leaves the potential for some photoreceptor damage. And if we do nothing, yeah, sure, he's 2020 now, but is he going to be 2025? in a couple months, maybe 2030 after that, if you leave it alone. So I also don't wanna let somebody get worse. So given the 2020 vision, we discussed that and we decided that we're gonna defer an injection. 
but we recommended doing the subthreshold micropulse laser to stimulate the heat shock proteins and try to stimulate additional resolution of this intraretinal fluid. So on September 21st, 2020, a couple weeks after that, we did the micropulse laser on the left eye. So I put one spot right there to target that microaneurysm with the surrounding exudates. And I got the gray burn that I wanted. So then I multiplied the power. It was a 50 milliwatt power to get that gray burn. And then I multiplied the power by three. I had a conversation with Caesar as I was actually initiating micropulse into my practice. And so we went over the settings together. Caesar, you probably remember this. And so I multiplied by three to 150. And then I delivered confluent 266 spots all the way up and down the macula, just like this, including this uh, micro, uh, microaneurysm exudate area. And so he tolerated the procedure well. And here he is a month later and he had bionic vision. He was 2015 actually in both eyes. So he was really, really motivated that day. And the intraretinal cysts had improved. They shrunk even further compared to the month prior. So we monitored at that visit and then a couple months later in December, the cysts are still shrinking. He's 2020. We monitored without treatment. Three months later, he's 2025 now in the right eye. The other eye is developing enlargement of that small area that he initially presented with. And then in the left eye, he's still 2020, but we're getting a little bit of enlargement again. So we opted for micropulse in the right eye, followed by the left eye. Here we are three months later. This is now uh, June 14th of 2021. So almost a year after he initially presented it to me and he's still 2020 in both eyes with improvement in the intraretinal fluid on both OCTs. And so we repeat the micropulse first in the right eye, then in the left eye a couple weeks later. And here he is on, this, this was the micropulse day for the left eye. We just have a tiny cyst left over there. So, in this case, and in many other cases in my practice for both DME and uh, neovascular AMD, I found micropulse to be safe and effective for patients with 2020 eyes. So we don't have to introduce the remote risk of a serious complication from an injection. So in the pandemic, micropulse is a really nice option because it has the potential to reduce the injection burden and space out the visits. It's hard for the patients to take time off of work and to come in. And especially for our elderly patients who are at risk from developing uh, life-threatening complications from a COVID infection, it benefits them not to have to come in as often. Um, and we have an opportunity to extend to three months or beyond. Now, one of the solo practice considerations that I've um, experienced is drug inventory. Um, you know, there are reasons for insurance denials such as prior authorization, uh, either the initial authorization or the renewal authorization for the high cost drugs like ILEA and Osrodex. Um, but with micropulse laser, I found that the vast majority of plans don't need prior authorization. So if the patient's sitting in your exam chair and they need or want something that day, that's something that you could potentially offer right away without needing authorization. I've also found that uh, the insurance companies require that we submit medical records or submit an NDC number for the drug in order to get it paid for. You never get anything like that with the micropulse laser and with the Sometimes they require the medical records, but definitely not an NDC number. Um, you know, other issues like a PCP referral expiring, or uh, there was one case where a patient needed to update his COB certification of benefits questionnaire in order to get a high cost injection approved. Um, if, God forbid, if there's a denial, then, you know, that's inventory that's lost and you can't get back for a high cost drug. But, you know, worst case scenario, if a laser is denied, you didn't actually you know, put up any funds uh, initially that can never be used again. The laser is a one-time cost and it stays with you for the duration of the practice. You know, there are some supply chain hurdle, hurdles that can occur um, with uh, injections. Uh, we had the famous winter storm in uh, February and I happened to have ordered several high cost drugs the day before the storm arrived. And so, you know, obviously, you know, the UPS delivery didn't make it that day. And so once I was finally able to see patients again, you know, there weren't any drugs available for them. And so the laser just sits with you in the office and if they need a treatment, that's something that could be done. So uh, for the case selection, 
There's data out there that suggests, and I completely agree that I found that uh, central foveal thickness, less than 400 microns, they tend to be the ones that do the best with micropulse laser, uh, whether it be DME or neovascular AMD. And so for my settings, similar to Caesar, I use a 200 micron spot size, 200 millisecond interval, 200 millisecond duration. And um, I can often combine the treatment with a targeted continuous wave thermal focal laser for the microaneurysm. So I'm combination sealing the microaneurysms while testing for the titration power for the micropulse. And then I multiply by three and switch to the 5% duty cycle. So for example, if I get a slight gray burn with the 50 milliwatts, then I multiply by three and I use the micropulse at 150. Or if uh, it's 130 milliwatts in a Caucasian patient to get a slight gray extramacular burn and I'll multiply by three, but if it exceeds 400, then I'll cap it at 400, just like Caesar does. The lens that I use is the area centralis from Volk, and uh, I haven't had any problems with fogging of the lens with the patients wearing masks during the pandemic. And for now, I also use a single spot size like Roger. And so uh, one study looked at the uh, comparison between fixed and variable power um, for the micropulse, whether you just do a flat 250 milliwatt for everybody, versus do the titration and they actually multiplied by four for their titration and they found no major differences between the two treatment groups. But for now, I'm still a titrator. So that's the end of my talk and I thank you all for joining us.